BC. He had his head chopped off and it was sent back to Rome. Faint familiarity there. Um, when I got back to Baghdad, I was talking to an Iraqi friend. He said, Mr. Robert, you know, you talk about military power. He said, can you explain something to me? And this is Iraq through the glass darkly from the other side, not the version you see in your papers. He said, can you tell me why the American military, in some form or another, you know, special forces, air bases, infantry divisions, he said, can you tell me why the American forces are in Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Afghanistan, Jordan, Israel, Turkey, Egypt, Algeria, special forces based in Otam and Rasset now in the southern Sahara Desert, Oman, Yemen, they're in Qatar, they're in Bahrain, they're in Kuwait. He said, can you tell me why? What are they there for? Pakistan? And in fact, you can actually go further north and south and say that the American Iron Curtain runs from Greenland through Britain, Germany, Yugoslavia, they're in Bosnia, Greece, and to Turkey. So we have this Iron Curtain running from the ice cap to the borders of Somalia. Why? What's on the other side of it? Oh, Iran is in the middle. I don't think Iran's a big danger to anybody. Pakistan is. They've actually got a bomb and lots of Taliban followers. But no, it's Iran that hasn't yet broken the law, who's got to be the center of crisis. Another part of the narrative of current events, which of course we have to follow because our presidents and prime ministers and generals and our journalists tell us that that's the problem. But no, on the other side of that Iron Curtain is India, China, and Russia. And don't tell me the Indians and the Chinese and the Russians haven't thought about that. But this is more of the questions, why? What are we doing? Is this really about the projection of American power or something else? You know, I keep going back to these same issues of why and how and what did we do. And I think that journalists, as well as their notebooks, should always carry a, a suitcase full of history books. One of the most amazing things I discovered in writing this far too long a book, it was meant to be 750 pages, is that the way in which we've always, we Westerners, always go to the Middle East to rescue people. We go with our swords and our horses and our Apaches and our Bradley fighting armoured vehicles, and we're always going to rescue them. You know Napoleon, at the time of the French expedition to Egypt in the 18th century, Napoleon issued a manifesto to the people of Cairo saying he was going to save them from being hanged by the Pashas who didn't believe in free speech. In 1917, the British army invaded Iraq and occupied it, led by General Sir Angus Maud. Maud put up a proclamation on the streets of Baghdad in the late autumn of 1917. Private Charles Dickens of the Cheshire Regiment, which was another regiment my father was in, peeled it off the wall, put it in his rucksack where it obtained the yellowing stains of his own perspiration in the following Iraqi summers, gave it later to his daughter who sold it to me for $2,000 just before our 2003 invasion of Iraq. And on this document, which is English one side and Arabic on the other, and it hangs beside my desk where I wrote this book, it says to the people of the Mahafazat, the governorate of Baghdad, we come here not as conquerors, but as liberators to free you from generations of tyranny. You see? Faintly, faintly. It didn't say George W. Bush, it said General Sir Angus Maud. <laughs> Maud died shortly afterwards in Baghdad because he drank milk without heating it. He's, he's now buried right next to the Turkish embassy, which got a suicide bombing a couple of years ago. But what happened? There was an insurgency against British rule in 1920. Um, the first British officer was killed near Abu Ghraib, a Captain Townsend. He was actually killed at a village called Handari, which I know very well because in the summer of 2003, I went to Handari because it was the place where the first American soldier was killed by a roadside bomb. And in the vast crowd of people there to whom I was trying to talk because they were witnesses to this, his blood was still on the road, one young man came up to me and said, my grandfather was the man who killed Captain Townsend, just over there. In retaliation, the British besieged with artillery a city called Fallujah. This is 1920. We also, because we were very good at this at the time, we also besieged Najaf, where we demanded the surrender of a Shiite cleric called Bada. We got Bada, you didn't get Sada. But nevertheless, you can see the parallels. In 1920, British military intelligence sent a telegram, which I've seen, to the War Department in London, saying that terrorists were crossing the Iraqi border from... Right, Syria. So you knew what British military intelligence said in 1920. <laughs> Amazing. In the British House of Commons, because the occupation by Britain was becoming very unpopular 
in my home country. Soldiers were dying, of course they were buried on the scene, there were no refrigerators to bring them back then. Very expensive, the First World War had already been over for two years. Lloyd George stood up in the House of Commons and said, if British troops are withdrawn immediately now from Iraq, there will be civil war. You see, again, you knew what Lloyd George said in the British Parliament in the 1920s. That is amazing, isn't it? No wonder we don't carry history books in our back pocket. There were lots of other parallels. Um, British military intelligence in 1915 said in Basra that we would be welcomed with flowers and songs if we went in against the Ottoman armies. And many of the Iraqis, who of course then were Ottoman soldiers fighting on the Turkish side, found that they were sent to prison camps in India where they were abused by their jailers. You see, it's, this, is, this is fingerprint historical parallels, which we will not and do not wish, of course, of course, to acknowledge. Where do we go? Why do we get it wrong? I think journalists should try to be more courageous. I think they should try to work for editors who are brave enough to print what they write. I have a great good fortune in writing for The Independent, which you can read uh, on various websites, even though you have to pay for it if you go to The Independent's website, another reason why I don't use the internet. Um, well, it helps my budget and lets me fly further. Um, nonetheless, uh, I'm very fortunate I have an editor who will print what I write. Um, sometimes things go a little bit astray. You take the Toronto Globe and Mail, which popped up not so long ago with an article of mine on the Armenian Genocide. But when I referred to the phrase, which I do in The Independent, the Armenian Holocaust, with a capital H, just as we, of course, rightly refer to the Jewish Holocaust with a capital H, the word Holocaust had been deleted, and in its place was tragedy. Like a problem, like a flood, or maybe an earthquake had hit the Armenians, right? So immediately I picked this up, one of my Canadian friends had actually spotted it, called me in Beirut, I called our syndication department, and I said, ha-ha, when they take our syndicated services, they're not allowed to change the words. So London called Toronto and said, ha-ha, why did you change the words? And it turned out, not only had they changed the word, but the editor had left, which apparently then absolved the Toronto Globe and Mail of actually apologising, and anyway, they hadn't taken the syndication service, they'd just stolen the story anyway. So they had to pay a fine, you know, congratulations. But you'll be surprised how often this happens. Since the Armenians, this is part of an Armenian week, I will say that one of the things I hope will happen, and as a journalist I say this too, is that in the coming months and years, Armenians will try, as Israelis and Jews have tried in Europe, to honour those brave Turks, in the case of the Jews and Israelis, those brave Europeans, who risked their lives to save the people who were stricken, those Turks in this case, who risked their lives to save Armenians. We know who some of them were, of course, that most of them are dead now, I'm sure all dead, but only the children are still alive and they're fading away now. But we know names, even in the British Blue Book, which was published during the First World War, there is, there is honour paid to Turks who risked their lives to save Armenian lives. Um, and I'm struck to say that because I want to read a very small, tiny paragraph of my own book because I've gone back and tried to interview almost every survivor of the Armenian genocide holocaust in Lebanon. I went to the Armenian old people's home. Down the corridor, a very old man is lying on a bed. He is Harutiun Kebejian. He is holding in his left hand a Bible in Braille and his right hand is fingering the embossed paper letters. He greets me with a so smile sightlessly. It is now the year 2000 and he is 93 years old. So he was eight when he survived the Armenian Holocaust. His memory is as clear as his emotions. He said, we lived in Dorchol. My father was called Sakis and my mother was Mariam. There were 10 children, including me and my brothers and sisters. The Turks collected all the people with their donkeys and horses. We were to go to Aleppo and Rasalain, but they started killing us on the way. The Turks forced us to the Habo River, and by the time we got there, there was only my mother and my sister and me left. They told the women and the men to take off all their clothes. My sister was 18, and a man on a horse came and grabbed her and put her on his horse. He did this in front of us. It happened in front of my eyes. I was not blind then, and they started to beat my mother. As she begged them not to take my sister, the Turks beat her to death. I have always remembered that as my mother died, she screamed my name, Harutiun, Harutiun. Later, an Arab Bedouin took me to his house, and I stayed there for three years. The war was over, and then people came saying they were looking for Armenian orphans. 
I said I was Armenian, so they took me to Aleppo. There I caught a virus that affected my eyes. I was suddenly blind, and I was only 11 years old. Until I was 23, I was filled with rage because the Turks took my sister and beat my mother in front of my eyes until she died. But when I was 23, I felt this was not the right way to be a man. So I began to pray to God so he would see me. I was making peace with myself. Now I'm ready to meet my God. I am at peace. Last year, when the big earthquake happened in Turkey, it killed so many Turks. And I prayed to God for those Turks. I prayed for those poor Turkish people. What a guy. I have to tell you that when I went to cover that earthquake, I found wandering in the earthquake zone of Istanbul a very bright, middle-aged Turkish man with his daughter, spoke beautiful English. And I said, well, what do you do? What are you doing? He said, well, actually, I'm the top earthquake specialist in Turkey, and they won't even pay my taxi fares to go and see what's happened in my country, the government. So I said, from this moment, you are working for the independent. So I took this guy around all the earthquake zones. It was an appalling horror. I mean, 40,000, I think, was probably the figure of Turks who died in that earthquake because, of course, their buildings have been built without proper anti-earthquake uh, protection. And when afterwards he and his family and family friends gathered beside the Basras, I remember I said to them, OK, well, here comes the big question, Armenian genocide. And they all said, yes, of course it happened. Our people were responsible, and we should say so. Well, we'll find out, because in October, the Turkish edition of my book, complete with the Armenian genocide chapter, which is called The First Holocaust, is being published in Turkish. An Armenian who speaks Turkish in Beirut has checked over the translation, and it's perfect. And I will be lecturing on the Armenian genocide across Turkey. So as they say in journalism, watch this space. Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, I'll finish by just saying two brief remarks. Firstly, I will not let 19 murderers change my world, and nor should you. Robert will now take questions from the audience. Um, just to remind you, uh, Robert will be signing books over here, The Great War for Civilization, as well as uh, Pity the Nation. Um, um, ladies and gentlemen, sorry again about the bits of film. They would have been worth watching. Uh, if you have any questions for Uncle Noam, as I always refer to him, but not usually in his presence, please shoot them at him as well. And there's always a wonderful moment when no one puts their hand up, but it's already happened. Um, I think there's a mic It's going to run around. There it is. And there's the first person there. Hello. Um, I, I thought you, uh, your talk was wonderful. Um, could you, um, based on your experience in Iraq, answer two questions? One um, is the actual level of con what is the actual level of control that U.S. forces have over Iraq relative to the the insurgents? And secondly, um, what are the can you elaborate on the specific ways in which civil war is being fomented and exaggerated by U.S. forces and their interests? Um. OK, number one, there is no control over the insurgency. From Kirkuk and Mosul in the north down to Basra, as I said, it is a state of total anarchy. There are gunmen on the streets of Baghdad within 550 metres of the green zone. Only when you're inside the green zone can you believe in the future of Iraq. This is a problem. Those of us who go on the streets understand all too well what the situation is. I'll give you an example from Amara, which is under, quote, British control, unquote. There's a deal being done between the British and the local armed tribesmen that every afternoon at 3.30, 
British armoured column will be permitted to drive through the centre of Amara and back to their fort again, and that's the end of British control in Amara. The fact that the British Embassy does not allow its staff to drive on the airport road to Baghdad, which is the main supply route for the Americans, tells its own story. Muggins here still drive that road many times, but it is horrifying. You know, there's one human rights uh, worker from this country actually was burned virtually alive and died because of a suicide attack on American uh, mercenaries on that road. Uh, 